So can you guys think any questions or things you're wondering about? What kind of person would it take to hitchhike then? What does that say about us? Oh, that says clearly you are deeply disturbed, neurotic oh. individuals. I mean, that, that goes without saying, but no. <laughs> well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, somebody who's going to choose to hitchhike has to have a pretty um, uh, good self-esteem. I think you have to have pretty, pretty high in optimism in order to, to be a hitchhiker, right? Uh, and I don't know, I, I'm guessing if you go for several days without being picked up at all, that could hurt the optimism. <laughs> but I think in terms of a trait, I think most hitchhikers are fairly optimistic and have pretty good ideas about the, the, the good nature of other people, because you're counting on that. I think you gotta be cheap. <laughs> <laughs> or poor, <laughs> as the case may be. <laughs> Well, it's the first day, and not too much more could have gone wrong. Gone. Well, it's the first day. <laughs> it's the first day, and not too much more could go wrong. It's been kind of a frustrating day, and I'm just kind of pissed off. The plan is to hitchhike from the sleepy Iowa town of Leon and arrive safely in Parkdale, Oregon to stand on Mount Hood. Yeah, I'm, you know, nervous as a person would be hitchhiking, but I've hitchhiked before and it's always been fine. Two friends, setting off with nothing but a faith in humanity. Along the way, we'll stop and play music in nursing homes, volunteer in food kitchens, and pick up trash we see along the way. We're calling this building up our road karma. We want to leave people with a better understanding of hitchhiking and find out why there seems to be a general distrust of our neighbors. What about living or traveling with Daryl for a month? <laughs> I could see both of us getting really frustrated at times. Especially if we haven't been moving for a long time, or if it's like a lot of physical discomfort. Josiah has this really bad habit of being too nice all the time. He's just such a nice guy, and sometimes you just have to be... <laughs> sometimes you just have to be a jerk. And I consider myself an extremely nice individual. And I also think that I'm very fair. But, I think Josiah might smother me with his kindness. I feel like Daryl and I are both pretty easygoing, and for the, the duration of this month, like really all we're going to be focusing on is this one thing, like just focusing on this trip, and that'll be it. I, no one has to stop, you know? No one has to be nice, we're just a couple guys on the side of the road. We're, I guess we're just hoping that human nature is, is good as we think it is. I'm excited for the days when everything just goes completely wrong. I think that's where the adventure is going to start. Good afternoon. My name is Eric Nelson and I am an associate professor of psychology at Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon. I think there's definitely generational differences too in who's going to pick you up. So like the generation before mine, it was really common for people to be hitchhiking. I mean my father-in-law did some hitchhiking and stuff and so in that generation it was it was you know pretty common and people would often pick up hitchhikers. Uh, but would you ever pick up a hitchhiker? It depends on the situation, circumstances. I mean somebody's cars broke down on the side of the road you know and they were walking towards the station or something I'd stop and pick them up yeah. I would not. I would. Nah. Okay, what is your attitude towards hitchhiking? Dangerous. Why is it dangerous? Scary, because anybody could pick you up. So would you ever pick up a hitchhiker? Nope. I guess I just feel, I feel like everything, like nothing's as safe now as what it used was to be. probably back then. Yeah. Like when our grandpas were growing up, probably it was probably, everybody did it. But now, I don't know. Like in my town, there's a lot of Hispanics. <laughs> And I would never pick one of those up. I think they're dangerous. Yeah, I don't think people yeah. are as good-hearted as they used to be. What has made us so afraid? Well, it's easy to see how pop culture and an insatiable thirst for bad news has instilled an attitude of distrust. 
The thought of a hitchhiker almost instantly conjures up an image of an ominous figure standing in the rain with an axe and a hockey mask. But chances are, we're not going to hear about a successful hitchhiking expedition, but we'll get an earful about all the trips that went wrong. First things first, check the laws in your state. Most don't allow hitchhiking on the interstate, so the on and off ramps are a good alternative. It's important to look clean cut and non-threatening, and one of the ways that we feel is best to do this is have an instrument and smile. Make eye contact as the cars pass. All of these are important to your image, which is the only reason that you get picked up in the first place. It's a good idea to text the license plate number to a friend. That way, someone will always know who you're with and where you are. And remember, you don't have to get into a car if it feels unsafe. You're not obligated to take a ride. Astonishingly few studies or worthwhile articles have been published about hitchhiking. Not that there haven't been attempts. In 1974, the California Highway Patrol commissioned a study with little success. In 1989, the latest study was commissioned in Germany to gather information about safety and numbers of hitchhikers, but again, came up with scant empirical evidence. So is it the lack of information that scares people? What is it? Does it run deeper than statistics? We want to find out. I think I'm in the right state of mind and I think I'm ready. Uh -huh. Okay. This is our fortune for the trip. The trick is you have to eat the cookie. Otherwise it won't come through. You ready for this? Mm -hmm. Start believing in your dreams. Others will catch the fever. That's pretty good. <laughs> in bed. You know, when it gets dark, we can pitch a tent and then start again the next day. So you're literally like taking rides from people you don't know? Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, we, that'll be the plan. Says, and you meet really interesting people. Because people who pick up hitchhikers tend to be Kind of risk takers too and so yes. it's always uh yes. a nice adventure and if you know if, if for some reason it's not a safe ride we don't have to take it and if one of us gets a bad feeling we'll just say yes. no we'll take the next one thanks a quiet storm quiet storm if the future holds to form or from nowhere comes an island where the winds are calm or would you train another day and see for a gentle kiss right now when tomorrow's just in soft La 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 Ooh, yeah So this is the end of day three for us We are in Kearney Spelled Kearney Nebraska Gosh, it's good to be out here. I just, I'm really enjoying it. Morning. I am making Daryl and my uh, breakfast. We have here Backpackers Pantry Denver Omelet. And maybe as you can see how, how good it looks, we're just trying to get it to firm up. I poured the water in here and uh, it might have been a bad idea. It, um, kind of turned to egg soup. A nutritious wilderness breakfast of egg soup. Mm. All right. There's a little firming happening. Who would have thought powdered eggs would be gross? Not me. Not me. So it's really starting to thicken up a little bit and look a little bit more like eggs, but... Um, kind of like egg pudding right now. It's a step up from soup. <laughs> All I need in the entire world is some egg pudding. <laughs> always, always listen to your mother. When she says don't get the powdered egg omelet, you don't get it. Ever. Ever. How is it? Good. 
We'll need to need some water with it. Does it make you think of Denver? I've been thinking of Denver this whole trip. Then let's go. Let's go. Let's go to Denver. Yeehaw. And uh, Chris, I guess since now that you're in the car and stuck with a couple of hitchhikers going to car, uh, North Platte, what is, uh, what's your attitude towards hitchhiking? Uh, you know, I, I think this is pretty legit. I think, I, I'm glad I get to be a part to help, to help you guys out. Um, I think this is probably kind of one of the coolest things I've done. Like, I don't normally do anything like this, random and, and spur of the moment. Yeah, so no, I, I think it's pretty cool. And I'm, I, I, now that I think about it, I'm pretty jealous of you guys because it seems like a pretty sweet journey that you're on. Would you ever hitchhike? Uh, you know, after meeting you guys, yeah, I would. I would now. Like everybody always talks about these horror stories, oh my God, I, I don't know what's gonna happen to you if you pick up a hitchhiker, but uh, you know, I don't know. I still have faith that most people are good. We were asked to leave the premises of two separate truck stops. Not a lot of Nebraska hospitality there. about 120 miles outside of Denver and we got a brilliant ride from Tara who happens to be one of the best people in the entire world. Evolutionary psychologists, which I'm a little bit critical of on the whole because I think they make great stories without any kind of empirical evidence, they would suggest that uh, you're going to pick up people who are like you. Uh, and the more similar they are to you, the more likely you are to have this identification uh, and feel like you should help them. I got off the highway, I saw you guys, you know, dancing around and smiling and I thought, okay, they look harmless. <laughs> After I talked to you, I think for like five seconds, I thought, okay. <laughs> I thought, okay, this, uh, this will be fun. It's, it's amazing the friendships that come out of nowhere. You know, such is life. You know, a minute you're up, the next minute you're down, the next minute, you know, you have a ride to Denver, nonstop. Uh, we had a place to stay, but unfortunately there is a, you know, miscommunication. We got here a little sooner than we, we meant to, and so, we don't have a place to stay at all, but we found out that my cousin said it was fine if we just stay inside his place. And so what we're going to do is we're going to call the security for the building. I'm going to do my uh, impression of my cousin and we're going to see if, if it works. Uh, hey, uh, this is uh, Will Viner. Uh, who am I speaking to? Oh. It Oh, sorry. Hey, Steve. Uh, hey, I actually have a couple uh, friends. One of them is my cousin and uh, his buddy and they're, they're going on a trip across the country and they're hitchhiking, but uh, I'm actually in Decorah, Iowa, and I forgot that they were coming in. And I guess what I need is, I was wondering if you'd be able to let them into uh, my apartment. It's 5.03. Okay, cool. Thank you. Bye. All right, so we have a place to stay. Yay! All right, that worked well. Hot dog, good job, America. Woo! A life on the road doesn't mean you have to go hungry. A free meal is as close as your local grocery store. And you may find more than a meal. You might just run into a kindred spirit. Went up towards Vermont, and I was going to try to get back to Colorado. But I stood in Troy, New York for maybe an hour, an hour and a half, and I started to feel like I'm not going to get a ride. 
so I decided to go up to Toronto instead and visit this guy who used to live in Denver. Sure. And I figured I wouldn't have difficulty finding him. He's gay, he's black, and he's a devotee of a guru. <laughs> but then five minutes later, some guy in a VW with the top down stopped, and he apologetically looked up at me and he said he was going to San Francisco. So I said I was going to Denver and he took me all the way to Denver. Wow. One ride. Yeah, I wish you guys some good traveling. Thank and you, I sir. hope people are people picking you up. Oh yeah, we've so had far. really great luck. Yeah. Excellent, yeah. excellent. Yeah. Iowa, huh? Iowa. Yeah. All right, I'm John and I wish you good success on the road. Thanks, sir. Thanks, John. Very much. All right. Yeah, there's a lot on the horizon for us. We were standing on the side of the road for a couple of hours last night, but uh, got picked up and got all the way to Denver and that, you know, that was great. We just have to keep hoping that they'll continue this way. Um, if they don't, they don't, and we'll, we'll deal with that as it comes. But so far, this trip has been a really, really positive experience. Teach me I put my backpack in your trunk, mm -hmm. which you're not supposed to leave your backpack at all because you could have gotten out and you could have just pulled away. Just like but away. <laughs> yeah, true. The fact that you were cautious when you pulled over and had asked us a couple questions and and made sure that we were all right, I, it kind of put me at ease too, because you know if someone is really excited and you know wants you to get in their car, I think that's the person you don't necessarily want to ride with. What's it like just picking up a couple guys off the highway and the next thing you know you're sitting in the mountains with them? I think that if I told people, they might think I was crazy, but I don't feel crazy. I'm just really happy to have spent some more time with you, and it's, it's almost like encouraging me to do things like this more, to get out more, and to make connections more. It was a, a little bit of faith on either part. Teach me to love, teach me to walk softly, to mediate conversation. Good morning. It is about 5.08 in the morning and we are going to volunteer at a soup kitchen. We're going to walk about a half an hour away. It's at Broadway and 22nd and we are at Broadway and 12th and MapQuest said it took about half an hour. So, here we go. The uh, Denver Mercy Mission started actually as a women's shelter to get prostitutes off the streets in the late 1800s. Back in the late, teen eight, uh, late 1800s, drunk tanks were like phone booths. And to get out of a drunk tank, all you had to do was reach around the corner and open the door. If you were too drunk, you uh, couldn't do that. Well, there was a gentleman that was coming out of a restaurant and saw a guy that was literally going crazy in a drunk tank, and uh, he let him out. When he was told he couldn't do that until they were sober, he purchased a wagon and started going around and picking up these, these usually men and taking them home to sober them up. Eventually, it got around to where they'd come, well, you need to go to such and such place. One of your boys fell off your wagon. And that's where it came from. <laughs> done 22 years in Supermax penitentiary systems. I was on Blood Alley itself. 16 years old, I did 12 years. This is another one of God's miracles. It reminds us exactly how much generosity and love and kindness is in the human heart. It's just as easy talking up it's talking now. When I was back in my uh, 20s, I actually did quite a bit of hitchhiking. And uh, it was a good experience, but it was a different time. So I have a teenager of my own today, and I certainly wouldn't want her out there with her thumb out. So, What's the difference, do you think? Um, it was the, uh, the 70s, the early 70s, and it, there was just a different feel to the world than there seems to be today. Um, I think that the connotation of being out on the highway without any form of your own transportation is very different today than it was back then. Here's the deal with what's happening now. Josiah and I have been trying to get a hold of a nursing home of uh, people in Denver, uh, but we've been getting the runaround from them and they're not sounding too terribly interested. And so we're just gonna 
fix that problem by just going there and saying, hey, we're gonna play some music for your residents and you're gonna like it. So Josiah and I have been trying to play some music for a nursing home here in Denver, but they've just been having a big cow about the whole thing. And so we decided that we'd really grab the bull by the horns and, and hoof it over there ourselves because we feel that the stakes are so high and our music offers such a moving experience for the residents. And the way that they've been so passive with us and so dismissive, we feel is just utterly absurd. And so, and, and it, it is true that Josiah and I do both get cutterflies in our stomachs, but that's not what's important. And I know that this might sound cheesy, but we're just milking it for all it's worth. I initially was jealous that you guys are doing this because I was unable to do it. I mean, it sounds like a, an epic journey. I mean, granted, there's the dangers associated with it, but isn't that part of the fun, you know? I mean, it's also a dying art. In fact, you guys are perhaps bringing it back single-handedly, you know? <laughs> you're, you're celebrating a, a dying art, and I think like most folk art, yeah, I'll call it hitchhiking a folk art, you know, unless you use it, you lose it. So I'm glad you guys are doing it. It's that initial perception, you know? So you guys have like, literally like, a second and a half to make this great impression, right? Oh, yeah. For someone to pick you up. So you did the guitar sign combo, which worked well. I'm not worried about you guys at all. Like, I, I honestly don't, I think most people are good people. My only concern is like, I think most people have gotten out of the habit of picking, uh, picking up hitchhikers, so it's no longer acceptable to go and, you know, stop. And so what kind of person picks up hitchhikers? Is that, that's my concern. It's a 100% success rate when you have no agenda and you have nowhere to go. And all you have is time and the inclination to go and to say, to say yes. To say yes to the next adventure and to get in someone's car. You know, just to know that there is maybe an undercurrent that is, how do I say this without sounding spiritual, but when perhaps greater than you in the sense that it's not about getting up and going to school or going to work or whatever, you know? Like, in fact, you, you can string it through. You can go from, you know, a small town Iowa to Denver in one ride. And, you know, a guitar and a sign. It turns out that does work, you know? And I hope that people don't forget that. I hope people don't forget that you can just go out and make it, you know, in any capacity you want. So we're exploring alternate forms of hitchhiking in the 21st century. And uh, we got a message from Katie on Craigslist. We put a little post on Craigslist and we got a message from her. So I'm going to give her a call right now to see if maybe we can set up a time. Um, yeah, so here we go. Hi, Katie. This is Josiah um, from Craigslist. What time were you thinking on leaving on Friday? Oh, gotcha. Pretty early sounds good. Seven is okay. Um, we've got two backpacks worth of stuff. Uh, I don't think so. Let me ask Daryl. Daryl, do you have any issues with dogs? Not at all. Not at all. Our eventual goal is Portland. All right. Yeah, talk to you later. Bye. Friday at 7 in the morning. We're going to Salt Lake City. Woo, Salt Lake City! <laughs> One of the cool things about this trip and about hitchhiking is it forces you to be really you know, friendly and open and, and, and really considering people as, as people. I mean, you're trying to get something out of them, that's true, you're trying to get a ride, but you really are trying to make a connection at every chance you can. And that's kind of a cool way to, to be living life. Down the bluff, they arrested me for littering. They said it didn't drop enough. They got the cleanest cells in Texas. And even their jailbirds got no soul. Wrap me up. The other day, Daryl and I were standing out at the side of the road, and um, some people drove by and would wave at us and give us a, an encouraging thumbs up, or, you know, they would 
point the, uh, the opposite direction from where we were going and, and you know, shucks or say maybe next time or some a couple rolled down their window and talked to us for a little bit and that was all those things are, are really encouraging and it it makes you wonder how often you just kind of pass somebody by maybe not somebody hitchhiking but just somebody who is looking for a connection that you're just not willing to give and I think I think I go through life a lot like that There's snakes out in the desert, there's fire and cinder, there's oil many... Oh yeah, so we just got off uh, Interstate 80 where we were bombarded with these beautiful billboards of 50 cent ice cream cones. And I just wonder if you could tell us about those. We have chocolate, vanilla, and twist. And after you see about 50 signs, um, yeah, you're craving an ice cream cone, definitely. Yeah. And people are very satisfied with the size of the ice cream cone that is made, or you can make your own. That is a tremendous ice cream cone value. So often we, we think connection has to be like something that that is really long term and maybe it, it might be a little troublesome if you have such a long term connection. Like you have to upkeep that. But um, I don't know, this trip has, has kind of been teaching me like just enjoy the moments that are right now. The moments that are happening right now for what they are. They don't have to lead to some amazing friendship or they don't have to lead to something anything more than a great conversation in a car or uh, a smile on the side of the road and those things are, are really important and I think I can feel myself being being changed a little bit. The only time I'll pick somebody up on the road is when they're backcountry skiing and they have skis or a snowboard and they just came out of the forest and they need a ride to the top of the pass. Otherwise I would never pick somebody up off the road if I were alone. Just seems smarter. One thing I was interested in is some of your observations about some of the cues that you get. Uh, on who seems to be a safe ride. Watch for a person's body language. If they can't look you in the eye or are acting a little shifty, don't take the ride. If someone asks roundabout questions about money, aka, can you help pay for gas? Say no. Say no, you have no money. This could be a tactic to see whether or not you have cash to steal. But please, by all means, offer to pay for gas after getting to know each other a little more or when you're getting out of the vehicle. Be wary of a car that pulls directly up to you. You see, there's a thought process that happens when a person decides to pick up a hitchhiker. So in psychology, we call that mental chronometry. When you look at reaction time uh, of mental processes to understand the human thought process. First, they assess the situation and decide whether or not they want to give you a ride. By the time that their decision is made and have come to a stop, they're a little ways down the road. You see, the person that pulls directly up to you is someone trolling, and they did not evaluate the situation. Josiah! Yeah? How's, uh, how's that view? It's so so. Oh yeah? Yeah, it could be better. I mean, you're not that high up or anything. <laughs> Alright, I'm gonna come down, is that okay? That's great. Immigrants, Tamagrant, dusty as the road. Oh, thankful as Wyoming's place to find the yellow stone. All right, let's do it. <laughs> Sit and watch her carve a slice of paradise below. Making Many people don't know this, but Josiah actually really enjoys walking around naked. Luckily we caught him with his pants on, but it's not uncommon to find him completely nude, running around the woods. So uh, our tripod broke and we taped it together, but um, when the camera sits on it, it kind of collapses in on itself. What we're gonna do is cut this little guy down to size and I think tape him in there and see if we can't fix it. 
Uh, we cut this little guy down, this little piece of wood, and sanded it with the file. Filed it, I guess, this would be the correct term. And now it fits in here. And... Wait, first you just say that you broke the tripod. Uh, the tripod got broken. Well, so Josiah broke the tripod. That is absurd and alive. And I'm just gonna tape this little guy in there. The one negative side of this thing is that we won't really be able to adjust it, but it should work now. Let's get some water, eh? Yeah. Sounds good. Look, a babbling brook. Super clear. It's like um, snow melt runoff, but if I've learned anything from Bear Grylls, it's uh, crazy clear. It's that even that stuff can have a little bug in them. I don't think you can see it that well, but there's this weird oily film over the top of the water. And we're not exactly sure what it is. Fresh to fall, the moons were filled to lead the night's parade. And far more stars than I have words. Kinda eggy. Seriously? The river down to pray. Do we even wash this? We're supposed to. <laughs> I will not take the blame for this. Ah, uh, that sucks. So those powdered eggs are gonna haunt us forever, man. Home and back to home with memories in all our needs. Packed up as we drove. Well, thank you very, thank you much, and thank you awful so for Montana and taste. I just heard something. What? I'm not trying to freak out, but it sounded like a bear, seriously. Huh. Yeah, so we found this. This is an owl pellet. It's like owl poop, essentially, but the owl eats these tiny little animals and then kind of like digests everything it can't. And, um,. There's like, like you can see all these bones and there's all this fur from like tiny little rodents. Like here's a couple of ribs of whatever animal. Oh, pull that up again. Oh, right. I dropped them. Here, I'll find another one. This is the, uh, the lower jaw of whatever animal, some little mousy or a vole got snapped up by an owl. A mousy or a bowl. Is it? Yeah. So, kudos to fourth grade science. We thought we were going to be staying in a tent on a mountain, but we decided to keep the luck rolling, so we think uh, we're going to stay in a cabin. Whose? We don't know. But we're going to sleep on their porch. Up here, or go sleep on the porch over there. Yeah. I think we've got a couple of options, so. Pitching the tent here is cool. I mean, yeah. it has a nice view. And that's, uh, the real estate's great over here. <laughs> and we think we're gonna pitch the tent with the Jacksons. Yeah, you know, I think the Jacksons are really friendly. I think this looks like a great porch. And also, it looks like somebody recently did the same thing as us. It obviously served one hobo good. Why not a couple more? After we have a night on the porch. El Porcho. Sounds good. Let the bubbles rise at midnight. Let their tongues get light as thieves. But when I die, let them toast to all the things that I believe. 
We caught a ride from a lady who took us right to the heart of downtown Salt Lake City. She said, I'll take you to a church. You'll fit right in. It's where all the other homeless people go. What social psychologists talk about this is called diffusion of responsibility. So if you're in a situation where there's lots of other people and something happens that requires a response, it's easy to think, well, somebody else is going to take care of it. So in hitchhiking, I guess, that would suggest you're going to be much more likely to be picked up if you're in a place that's fairly remote and there's not lots of traffic. So it's going to be a lot harder for them to, to ignore you because they know that, like you know, I suggest, nobody else is going to, is going to help you. It's about 7.45 at night and we are walking probably another mile, two, three, four miles. <laughs> I honestly think we should turn around if it's going to be that long. It's like, like two miles, man. Two miles, yeah, but I mean, if we get there and, we doesn't, and it doesn't work, well, like we're in the sketchiest neighborhood. Yeah, but that's what I've been saying this whole time, that it's going to take a while. Like, <laughs> like, like dump dogs, look crazy. We already got kicked out of one place. We we're gonna sleep on the roof. No, this isn't ideal. This is not. I, this is not an ideal situation that we have here. Look, that's 1513. It is on 100, and somewhere down that way. Okay. Like, I don't know. Are you okay with getting kicked out, walking back in the middle of the night through the sketchy neighborhood with all of our stuff? Are you okay with that? The other option is to sit in Denny's. That sounds super lame, but it's a place that we won't get robbed. We both talked about this at the beginning. If either of us was uncomfortable with the situation, then we should not do it. I think we should honor that and honestly honor that. So uh, we're looking at the uh, wonderful 24-hour IHOP. That's what we're looking at. In the words of my dad, that if, if it were easy, everybody would do it. And it's been fairly easy so far. And it's nights like this is why, is really why people don't do this. Yeah. But more importantly, like we're experiencing a side of life that people will never experience. And it's not easy, but you learn a lot about yourself. This is what we're gonna remember, and this is like what's important about all of this. So uh, all is well, we're gonna, you know, we will eventually sleep somewhere. Uh, we will wake up in the morning and we will be on a train tomorrow morning out of Salt Lake City. And hopefully we're out of Utah short there, shortly thereafter. Amen. Home sweet home. Hey! Hey, America! Good to see you guys. <laughs> Southern hospitality we're exists in other places besides the South. So we're gonna stay here all night until we get to the train. We're in a tiny little booth, and hopefully we can stay here until morning. Maybe even sleep. Here it is, decaf. I hope we can stay here all night. <laughs> the night is young. <laughs>question for, tra for the travelers, okay? Yes. What is with girls and thinking they can eat the middle of the sandwich? Just the middle? The best bite of the sandwich. Okay, mm -hmm. you're eating the sandwich. You get to that middle piece, yeah. you've taken the bite on this side, you've taken the bite on this side, you've eaten the crust around the top. And now, on purpose. Yeah. right when you get to that best part of the sandwich, you get a girl to look over at you and go, can I? It's exactly 12. Okay, it is 12 o'clock, it feels like four. We're here until uh, probably 5 or 6 a.m.
I'm gonna sing with Janis Joplin, watch her shake that thing and hear nothing in her pockets but freedom's ring. But don't think for a second you had nothing to lose her, cause it froze your heart and stole your blues and blues. Rattle the train. So we slept last night inside of the IHOP. And I don't know if that's an experience uh, too many of you have had, but you wake up the next morning feeling like you just slept at an IHOP. It's about five minutes to six. So uh, here's the church that we went to yesterday morning. Um, and it was kind of funny that we ended up finding a little bit more hospitality at the IHOP. <laughs> We're going to try and hop a train to Ogden, hopefully get a campsite and hopefully get some sleep. You've crawled through the soot and you searched a long and 14 stations later you rode back home. We were able to sneak onto the only abandoned passenger car, the most luxurious train hopping experience on record. A stroke of luck, but... It wouldn't last for long. We are literally in the middle of absolute nowhere. And we're walking to nothing, to absolutely nothing. So in psychology of, of studying empathy, it turns out there's a couple of different types of empathy. There's cognitive empathy, where you kind of can think about a person's situation and uh, take on their perspective. Uh, and then there's emotional empathy, where you really are kind of identifying and can feel for the plight of an individual. I'm guessing both of them probably play a role in picking up hitchhikers. So here we are, back on that same highway. St still walking into the middle of nowhere, you know, like you do. <laughs> and we just got passed by a truck spraying chemicals and and we thought that was pretty bad. Fortunately, here's another one spraying the same chemicals. Not only are we going to get lost out here in the mountains of Utah in the middle of nowhere, but you know, I mean, at least we're going to have a quick, painful death by asphyx asphyxiation. Asphyxiation. That's what I said. I said asphyxiation. At least we're going to have a quick, painful death, quick, painless death of asphyxiation. Asphyxiation? Okay. Asphyxiation. Well, there's that bug truck, and at least we're just gonna have a quick, painless death of asphyx asphyxiation. Asphyxiation. Asphyxiation, right? Go away. Asphyx asphyx asphyxiation. <laughs> asphyxiation. <laughs> What's the word? What a Asphyxiation. Asphyxiation. Now it just sounds wrong. I hope it's right. A quick painless death by asphyxiation. That sounds right. That sounds like the best possible thing. As soon as I got home, my wife said, where are you going? And I says, I have got to go rescue these two young men. <laughs> Because they don't have the foggiest idea where they're headed. <laughs> we got a ride from, sorry, what's your name, sir? Mr. Larson. Mr. Larson. Mr. Larson. All right, who has a hobby of collecting golf balls? I've got over 100,000. <laughs> but I collect them all over the world. Oh, yeah? Uh, I picked them up in Hawaii and just every state. Oh, wow. It's a pretty good hobby. Yeah, it's yeah. Like a pretty <laughs> successful hobby to me. <laughs> but I tell you, what impressed me about you two was how clean cat you was. Oh, oh yeah? And when I seen you two, I thought, man, these guys aren't going to hijack me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a leader in our church. Okay. I belong to the Mormon church. I don't know if you've ever heard of us. Uh -huh. Weird bunch, but we trekked across Missouri back 150 years ago. And so one thing that's always been important in my life is helping others. Because that's what our church teaches.
what we're going to try to do today is set a snare for a small mammal such as a rabbit or a squirrel. And what you do, you get a thin piece of wire slash fishing line. I saw this done on a number of highly respected YouTube videos. So I'm sure it works great. Take your freshly tied fishing line circle. Follow me, come, it'll be great. We're setting snares for squirrels and bears. All right, what we have here is the snares tied around this bigger stick that will not be pulled out of the ground by a rabbit or a squirrel and also held open by this tiny stick, which only job is to hold the circle open. And so what you really want to do is grab some other sticks and whatnot. Okay, not that one. You don't want to grab that stick. Or that one. You don't want to grab that either. Wow, this is turning out to be just great. <laughs> so first of all, you need to pull up the world's worst stick and just kind of... I don't... I guess you just want to lay it down there, I guess, is all you really want to do. The chances of this working are about one in seven. Uh, that's not true. About one in a million. And so I'm not holding my breath. We're going to go ahead and eat our freeze-dried food. Beef stroganoff, beef stroganoff, beef stroganoff. We're going with the beef stroganoff with the noodles. Beef stroganoff, beef stroganoff, beef stroganoff. I can't get enough of beef stroganoff, beef stroganoff. Would you say that that's about a beef stroganoff consistency? I hope so. I bet it looks like a litter box. Yep. We got picked up by this awesome guy named Mr. Larson, which was really cool. So he took us to this little place, and we've been here ever since. And it is gorgeous out here, and we just got in from the fire. The trip is about half over right now, and yeah, I don't know. It's it's hard to think about that. Boys to Boise. Yes, please. Hey, the last person I picked up he had a puppy. And uh, it only took him three days to get from Iowa. The Book of Mormon came about is the revelations given to Joseph Smith. He was told, go dig in this place. He uncovered a stone. There were a bunch of gold plates. They had weathered the time, and he translated those into English. It laid the groundwork for my whole life. It learned me how to budget my time. It learned me how to set goals and accomplish them. And it learned me that the most important thing in life is other people. Well, the ones that bug me the most are the ones that are complaining that there's so many LDS people. And if you don't like the LDS people, move. And our youth today, you know, they don't feel the urge to settle down and get married. If you're a man, and you live your whole life, and you go to church, and you do a lot of service for other people, and you are devoted to God, and you do the things that you're asked to do, but you never get married. You can still live in the celestial kingdom, okay? You will be maybe the right-hand man of somebody that is married. You like being single, you're gonna be single for all eternity, but you can live with God. Because, I mean, you boys, I guess neither one of you is married. But we believe when you get married, that that marriage goes beyond the grave 
that you can live eternally forever and ever as husband and wife and your family. And we believe in that. We do the baptisms for the dead, which means that um, our youth, 12 years and older or adults can go in and they're baptized for someone else that has already died. And it gives them the opportunity while they're in the spirit world to say, okay, I accept that. And that's God's way of being fair. And that's what I do. And I go to these temples every day and perform these ordinances for those people who never had the opportunity here in this life. And I have done that for 437,000 people. It's taken me every day for 40 years. Amon Grants from Amon Grants, home and back to home. With memories and all our needs, packed up as we drove. It doesn't matter what religion you are, it doesn't matter where you're from. Recognize the fact that people are people and people like to be treated with dignity and respect and humor and just to be recognized as something, you know, of value. John led us off in Meridian, Idaho, and we set up camp in the only available spot. Here's our camera. This is what it's not supposed to do. Oh, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. So Daryl's on the phone with Idaho camera, and we're hoping that they can fix it. Uh, fix it like today or tomorrow. Okay. No dice. Can't work on it. So we have to go to the other one. Yeah. Okay. So let's see if he can give us a ride. Let's just yeah. ask him. Uh, so we're getting a ride from the manager here at KOA and we're going to Telco. Yep. Hopefully. Hopefully it'll work. Ron was kind enough to drive us into the repair shop. But after being told by two different reputable dealers to try hitting the camera, we decided to send it back to the manufacturer. So that leaves us with our small secondary camera. But to ease the pain of the loss, Ron asked if we'd like to explore a lava tunnel with he and his son. Without the slightest clue as to what that meant, we eagerly said yes. Little did we know it meant driving into the field in the middle of nowhere Idaho tying a rope to the back of their jeep and rappelling 40 feet into a hole. On the way, there were jokes like, all right, hand up your wallet so no one can identify your bodies. You know, real funny stuff like that. The queens lose their heads Yeah, and the poppers laugh Cause they're better off than dead The cakes are empty and castles cold Wine thick with lead Yeah, but the beans are soaking The yacht is full of bread Bells ring and angels sing Their harmonies and dance Okay The honky-tonk and witches punch makes children That's gonna make great TV! swings his claws Cause when you dance on air You're bound to fall Guns don't argue and the badge don't lie The man knows no bounds But now the hunter's hunting A 
and loose the hounds. When priests and rabbis fight to see who play the host, yeah, while the God is dancing. The question that we've been asked most frequently is Do you have a gun? I just think for your own protection you need it. It's okay. not to kill anybody, it's just for your protection. Would we be able to see your gun? Uh, no. It's okay. concealed. That's fair. That's fair enough. Mm -hmm. Sure. No, I don't pull it out unless I use it. And that's the best way it should be. Yeah. And most of the people in this park, I'll imagine probably most of them have two to three guns in their coaches. They just carry them with them. Because most of these people have sold their homes or lost their homes and they travel, you know, with it. That makes sense. So they don't have any place to put their guns, so they pack them with them. Hmm. Well, keep that in mind before we rob one of them, then. <laughs> I don't think really that. No. <laughs> that would Gosh. not be a good deal. Yeah. But we believe having a gun eliminates any fundamental trust right from the beginning. But horror stories come from somewhere. The nightmares do exist. Whether it's the teenage girl from California that had her forearms cut off, or the tragic story of Colleen Stan. Stan was hitchhiking from Eugene, Oregon to Redwood, California when she was picked up by a young couple with a baby. Accepting that ride was the start of a seven-year hell for Colleen. Her captor, Cameron Hooker, took her as a slave tortured, raped, and kept her in a wooden box for the next seven years. She eventually escaped and managed to put Hooker away. But, as important as it is to acknowledge these stories, it's just as important to keep them in perspective. What would life be like if we let worst-case scenarios determine our choices? Every time you get into a car, there's a certain amount of risk. Is getting a bad ride any more likely than getting in a car crash or falling off a ladder? Should blind public opinion keep you locked up? Should the fear of what if affect your spirit of adventure? We don't think so. As we crossed into Oregon, we quickly learned what the locals affectionately call a road soda. We found that potentially dangerous situations can be easily diffused with humor and kindness. That and puppies. Dreamers had the truth. So I gazed into the clouds and look, I found a song for you. It's a tale of sweet Odyssey. My name is Janet Homan. I live in um, Eastern Oregon, Northeast Oregon. And I'm just getting off a road trip myself. So when I saw you two guys, I thought, well, what the heck? And I will have to admit, the musical instruments out probably helped. I don't know if a puppy would have been better or not. But anyway, I'm sorry I can't take you all the way to Portland. So mostly it's been single drivers and more women than men. Okay, interesting. I uh, used to hitchhike a little bit when I was in college, which was in the 70s, which well, seems like ancient history of you, doesn't it? When I did it, I didn't do it a lot, but I never had a bad ride. So I don't know if it's changed. I know you don't see as many people doing it now. Although where I live, you don't see a lot of hitchhikers anyway. Would you recommend it, hitchhiking? As a way of, tra well, I mean, I would. Partly because nothing ever was, I mean, I had no trouble with it. But of course, if you got a bad ride, it probably would change your outlook a whole lot. We got a ride from Janet, and she was she was awesome. She was such a cool lady. I really liked her a lot, and I thought she had some really interesting things to say uh, about hitchhiking and just like her experience. And like Josiah and I were just talking about her hands and how and how gnarly and worked and. You know, just aged they were. You know, they her hands had had more experience than I don't know than a person should. I think that I think they were the most beautiful hands I've ever seen. And I think she was awesome. 
Give us a ride to Portland, please! For four? But, like I say, I really have no idea. <laughs> and I wish you well. You guys should write a book at the end of this. There's oil men in Lubbock. There's bankers in Fort Worth. But now I'm scared to leave South Congress. They might kill me or worse. They might think that I'm a villain. Wrap me up in Austin. Where a bum can wear his panties like a man. God's country, and they fill their cups with spit. Well, maybe God felt sorry for the Baptists and the Hicks. I don't give a damn for Texas. I expect that she don't give a damn for me. Uh, I've never actually picked up a hitchhiker in my life before, so. Oh, how's the, how's the experience so far? You guys seem pretty cool. What so, prompted this? Well, I was giving her a ride, and I drove up here originally by myself. We were supposed to carpool, but nobody lives in my area in Portland, so. I drove up by myself and she needed a ride and we were driving down the road and I saw you and you guys were carrying a camera and all those bags and you looked nice enough, so I was like, well, I'll help out. <laughs> a highlight of getting to Portland was getting our camera back. We found it patiently waiting at a friend's place in working order. And did we mention that we made it to Portland? We've made it to Mount Hood, and here we are, but we're not very far up the mountain. So, what we're doing is walking to the main road, trying to hitchhike up the mountain, and then hopefully hitchhiking back down before uh, six or seven o'clock. Welcome to Mount Hood! We made it! It's 41 degrees out right now, and uh, we're at about 6,000 feet elevation. <laughs> and uh, Mount Hood is right up there, which you can't see because of the clouds. We made it as high up the mountain as we could while not having ropes, picks, ice climbing gear, or winter coats, which we neglected to bring in our 2,000 mile hitchhiking journey. Really, a mountain is all about perspective, and it's about the perspective that it affords you being so high up and looking over everything or giving you a lofty goal to look at. Suddenly I could see the whole scope of our trip laid out before us and all the people we met and all the experiences we had so far it really put into perspective the whole trip. I think having a mountain for a finish line worked out really well for us. From the moment that we talked about doing this just as a little idea to the moment where we were standing on Mount Hood. I mean, you created something. It's something private. I think that you can't share. You can try, but you can't experience it until you do it. Even something as simple as a hike with friends into a highlight of our trip. We 
went to church and looked on Jesus and how it stretched him across the post. Our sins washed down his body and cross naked flesh and eyes were closed. And at night he shared the burden of his brother lying close at hand in hand. And just like Jesus. I think accomplishing this goal is, I guess it really instills in you this confidence that things that you want to do and the things that you think you can do, like, you really can, like, they really can happen. And all it takes is putting your mind to it and going and doing and saying yes to opportunities. Thou shalt not steal thy neighbor's money, nor take thy neighbor's life. Thou shalt have for desire, not thy neighbor for his wife. They sheathe their swords inside their Bibles, and when they come, they come to meet him straight into the Bible. It takes a meaning all when you preach the love of hate, when you preach the love of hate. A guitar and a sign and your friend and you can get halfway across the country and it's easy and you meet great people and you have a lot of fun and it's cheap and it's possible. I don't know what did we accomplish? We proved the hypothesis that that people are, are genuinely good. We set out to prove that hitchhiking can still happen and that this subculture doesn't have to die out and this it's not as dangerous as you think and there are real precautions that you can take to making this a fun safe exciting wonderful experience and i think i think we accomplished that it's an amazing way to travel you can meet so many wonderful people and and you can be safe doing it i think we were both very prepared i don't think you can be prepared for something like that. When you're putting yourself in a position where you're constantly needing someone else to help you out, I don't think you can be prepared for that. Um, because you don't know. We don't know who's going to stop and pick us up or if people will stop and pick us up. You can go anywhere. You could end up anywhere in the United States the next day. And you have everything you need right on your shoulders. And there, there's something special about that. When you open yourself up to the possibility of needing others, it puts you in this position where it's going to stretch you and it's going to change you and it's going to move you and it's going to force you to see the world in a new light. And I think only good things can happen when you put yourself in that position. Taylor and Bethany. Bethany. Yeah. Awesome. So we met Taylor and Bethany and they're hitchhiking to California. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I mean... Not all of my friends hitchhike, but I, I tell them about it and, you know, like, like, oh, isn't it scary? Like, don't you, I don't know, get picked up by creeps or anything? It's like, no, not really. I mean, I think that's kind of a, I mean, I'm sure it happens, but I think it's a misconception. Um, we plan to go to Arizona and then work our way up through Colorado, stay in Denver. Can we, can we get a little ditty on that? A little ditty? Um, okay.
right. That's awesome. Well done. Thanks. That sounded good. That's that way sounds, better than what we said. That sounds way better than our ukulele. Definitely. Yeah. Way One, two, three. Don't you worry about me I will be okay I'm gonna take it like I find it Live this life day by day Let my troubles be my road map To where I do not want to be Then I'll hang on until the morning worry about me Mountain truck stop and a phone call Hello mama